everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. So tonight is our last panel session. Uh, we are welcoming today Walid Sadeh, and the talk will be moderated by uh, Lamia, Abou, um, Lamia Abou Khadra. Uh, so this series of talk, as you know, was curated by uh, Halia Hamdan, that is just here. And uh, don't forget that next week, it will be the presentation of our eight participants. So it will be on Friday and on Saturday from 6 to 10. And on Saturday night, we will have a party until midnight. So I wish you a, a nice talk, and I will give the mic to Alia. She will present her uh, concept. Thank you. Thank you, Marie Mathilde. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, so I wrote my curatorial curatorial note thinking about the current period and its temporalities, the period of the collapse, and how we can reflect on the ways our bodies are acting and registering the effects of uh, this period. Um, three weeks ago, <coughs> Lawrence Abu Hamdan gave a, presented a figure uh, that he calls the returnee or the reincarnated witness, which by allowing uh, his body to be permeable to other bodies and his speech to be permeable to other speech, namely the dead, is able to circulate between different historical phases or periods in Lebanon, the war, the post-war, and the collapse. Uh, last week, Faris Shalabi presented his talk, and it was the main headline was kind of dealing with how we act when we found ourselves in a sectarian system and context. So he compared different periods. And also he did a sort of comparative aesthetics between the period of the war, the post-war, and the collapse, and suggested in an extension of his talk that will be soon on the uh, Goethe Institute or Art Evolution Channel. Art Evolution channel on YouTube, that we are now in a uh, new aesthetic regime, which is that of optic and pop art, uh, a sort of optical materiality when it comes to uh, vision, pop actions, or popular actions when it comes to acting today. And uh, he presented a figure of the body, which uh, is now indiscernible from its own image. Tonight, we are happy to have with us Walid Sadeh. I will uh, read his uh, um, synopsis. Which, does the, which is incorrect now. Mm -hmm. OK, so maybe we keep it as a open? Yeah. OK, so we keep it open. Maybe I will just simply present Walid Sadeh and Premia <coughs> Bukhadro. Walid Sadeh, uh, for those who don't know them, uh, is an artist and writer. His early work is an attempt to assess the lingering familial legacies of the Lebanese Civil War. His later work, between 2006 and 2016, proposes a theory for a post-war society, disinclined to resume normatic, normative living. In recent years, sensing a fundamental socio-political uh, and intellectual change in the country, Sadeh decides to conclude his post-war work and begins to theorize the conditions of living in a time uh, after the time of the post-war, during which the memories of war are reduced to empty ciphers that can no longer constitute a shared history. Walid Sadeh is professor in the Department of Fine Arts and Art History at the American University of Beirut. Uh, Lamia Abu Khadra, who will be moderating the talk tonight, is an artist whose practice studies how disasters can resurrect and generate new forms of perception, collectivity, and resistance, using the Palestinian and Lebanese contexts as microcosms of urgencies. Lamia graduated from the University of Minnesota with a BFA in interdisciplinary studio art, in 2018. 
she was 2019-2020 uh, Home Workspace Program Fellow at Ashkal Alwan in Beirut, as well as a 2021 Jan van Eyck Academy resident in uh, Maastricht. Okay, so the floor is for you. Uh, first, uh, thanks are due to Goethe, Mariatik, Milena, Art Evolution, Zukar, and Adia for inviting me. It is a uh, privilege and a challenge to speak after Laurence Abu Hamdan and uh, Fari Shalabi. A privilege because so much has been said, it kind of allows me to. Uh, to relieve myself of having to uh, frame my work historically. Uh, <clears throat> but it's also it's a challenge because I find myself now trying to write a text about uh, this current period, about which we all have a lot to say, but maybe we have not yet theorized it. So that, that's the challenge. Um, but after listening to Faris's uh, uh, presentation last week, I changed my plan. So the 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 abstract that um, Ali was about to read is no longer relevant, and I decided to go back to a few notes I jotted down two years ago, and kind of left uh, when I saw a. Uh, a stenciled uh, graffiti um, on Abd Aziz Street, Las Beirut. Uh, I wrote a few, a few, wrote a few like, preliminary thoughts, and I left it. And I thought maybe it is time now to uh, develop it. So the last few days, I've uh, I tried to write a short text, and um, it has all the eagerness of a new text, and probably all of its uh, misgivings as well. So. Yeah. <clears throat> so here we go. Um, today is the 4th of November, 2022. Two years and three months have passed since the detonation of the Beirut port. The official investigation is stalled. The city and its inhabitants are ravaged by a criminal economic crisis, a fabricated depreciation of the local currency, protracted political sectarian corruption, an unending COVID-19 pandemic, and an outbreak of cholera. And if one is to look for traces of the uprising of October 17, 2019, in search of a clue, in search of a leeway or a purview, little is found, except perhaps in the bosoms of bereft individuals in a small, care-worn communities, in furtive non-hierarchical collectives, and sometimes on the walls of the dilapidated city where much is scribbled, sprayed, and plastered, plastered, and where from that layered and worded volubility a stenciled sense statement one day surfaced for me. Sharp and reviloquent it read, we will not call for accountability, we will avenge. So this evening, uh, I call on us to bring ourselves before this stenciled statement and linger. Here, I think there's much to think about, but also much to feel. Where are we today from this injunction to avenge? Where are we today from this enjoiner to bypass the legal process of indictment and steadfastly move to the fact of revenge? Of course, readily, much, much can be quickly said and retorted, such as the odds are insurmountable, it's impossible to avenge because the dominant network of power is armed and in control and the various factions are ult ultimately in treacherous collusion, no matter their deafening mediatic babble and contentious chatter. But let us not rush and dismiss this call, the call to avenge of the stencil graffiti. 
let us instead linger and try to sketch a figure of vengeance. I'm careful here to speak of a figure as not to presume a body, a somebody, an everybody, a body politic, or a collective body. Rather, I wish to sketch a figure. What is a figure? It is a set of constraints and possibilities that appears and disappears against another set of constraints and possibilities, or what is simply called the ground. And in this dance of appearance and disappearance between the figure and the ground, and this pulsating visibility and invisibility, the figure can be both generous and precarious in as much as the ground claims to be stable and constant. A figure, therefore, is a dynamic position to enter into with the body without necessarily fully embodying it is a set of possible actions to perform without necessarily upholding an essence. But to sketch a figure of vengeance today is a difficult task, or rather a fraught endeavor, because we are overstuffed with contrary evidence. In other words, to think and sketch such a figure, one must resist the crushing obviousness of structural violence that belittle our quotidian living. One must also resist the numbing common sense of widely shared opinions. Also, one must refuse the codification of despair in shared daily parlance, as one must also suspend the brute fact that no one has as yet answered the call for vengeance. But firstly, and let us begin, the difficulty of the endeavor lies in its anti-realism. And this is, I think, where our deliberation ought to start. So just to give you a head start how the, the paper is constructed, uh, I'm, I'm trying to develop a theory or a figure of vengeance uh, through eight uh, propositions. So first is anti-realism. Uh, I would like to propose that revenge suspends grieving and neglects, neglects the futurity of mourning. Revenge promises instead an action against reality. It is anti-realistic. It affirms a hidden just time, or to use the Greek term a kairos, which means a time when conditions are right for the accomplishment of a crucial action. affirms a hidden kairos, or a just time, lurking in the chronology of a dominant discourse that steadily and cruelly marches forward and away from the time and place of a wrong committed. In its anti-realism, revenge refuses to be dragged forth or pulled along by the victorious discourse that explains away or rather dismisses the wrong committed. Revenge, unwilling to ride the wagon of historicism, historicism basically is the history of the victorious, revenge boldly alights, it jumps over the wagon, jumps out of the wagon, to walk and speak backwards against the forward flow of the victorious text. Revenge, I think, is reading in reverse. 
with a troublingly scratchy and unintelligible voice, like that of a vinyl record when played backwards. I suppose that historicism cannot understand, cannot fathom what the past sounds like when revisited. And revenge like the phon ph phonographic needle climbing backward and outwards the ridges of the record's vinyl groove claims that time can be walked and spoke, spoken backwards, but not without violence exerted on both the avenger, the stylus, and history, the groove. Two, anti-architecture. For all its furtiveness, its hiddenness, revenge grows underground, but for a while, short while. When in hiding, revenge is busy feeding its anger. A poison tree, as William Blake wrote, watered with fears and tears, and sunned with smiles and deceitful wiles. But when ripe and ready, revenge shines bright and stands high, tempting like a skyscraper marked for demolition. And revenge is very different from assassination. Assassination is best done in silence, hence the propensity for using guns fitted with silencers. But revenge, on the contrary, seeks to make a spectacle of itself. It is both demolition and fireworks. It is a structure collapsing and remaining vertical as it slides down into its own surface area, and fireworks shooting upwards and marking in spectral smoke and colors the hubris that was built on the wrong committed. Revenge is kind. In a world without justice, Revenge replaces the search for justice with kindness. In fact, in a world without justice, revenge is the only kindness available. It is loyalty to loss, and therefore a form of redress for what is forgotten. Kind is revenge because it lingers where a wrong was committed and then abandoned without being righted. Kind is revenge because it doggedly memorizes and re-memorizes the crime and stubbornly dismisses all of what continues to live, to live after. Kind is revenge because it weds itself to the denigrated past and wraps its unneeded future into a bundle and of it makes a velvet pall to shroud that which justice never saw and that which history duly forgot. Revenge also is also kind because it is loyal to self, to the self of the avenger. But here, kindness is disconcertingly pure, without a future, empty of any therapeutic value. Kindness to the self of the avenger is unconditional. It asks nothing of the avenger. Not betterment, not catharsis, not overcoming, and certainly not a reconstruction of the broken self. This unconditional kindness is pure because it simply embraces that which is shattered and cannot but remain shattered. Revenge is vacuous. When we read moral treaties and when we read psycho psychoanalytic treaties, we're told we see that revenge is often disparaged for being a misguided action that claims to fill the void left by the absence of justice for a crime committed. As such, it is mistaken for retribution. So in Arabic, if revenge is intiqam, retribution would be aqab. It is mistaken for retribution and judged as false and inefficient. But whereas retribution or al 
suggest a just or deserved punishment for some evil done carried out by an impersonal almighty. Vengeance, on the contrary, is blatantly wrathful, vindictive, and furious. It is supremely personal, dense and concentrated in the narrow and precise barrel of a vociferous partisan gun. Revenge cannot be brushed aside for being misguided precisely because it does not seek to fill any void, nor does it claim catharsis or closure. It has no interest in debating with Christian morality or normative psychotherapy, for revenge is not moral. It does not act towards a moral standard. It acts only towards that which has been forgotten by laws and overlooked by moralities. Accordingly, revenge is absolutely singular. It neither wants to replace a failed legal system and in doing so rehabilitate the need for it, nor mend history by excising the sham future of a past wrongdoing. Revenge brandishes its vacuity in the face of morals, in the face of legality, and in the face of history, and of that vacuity makes its aesthetic form. In other words, revenge mistrusts sequential organization periodization and commemorations. And in the face of these reasonable societal practices, it shouts its vacuity with an ostentatious spectacle. <coughs> Inconclusive. Revenge knows of a closure, but recognizes its impossibility. For such a closure, for such an impossible closure to happen, revenge must accomplish a coupling. The dead and still warm body of the murderer next to the warm body of the murdered. It's an impossible cu coupling because it wishes to fall back time so that the wrongdoer returns to the place of wrongdoing as if no time has passed. Wanting to complete what it sees as an incomplete picture by wishing to correct the picture of the crime scene with the addition of the body of the murderer, revenge reaches its limit, that's a possibility, and in turn chooses the exaggerated spectacle to mark the impossible. In this sense, revenge never runs the risk of landing on a wish's disappointing fulfillment. In, in Sam Mendes's film, Road to Perdition, from 2002, cinema recognizes revenge's deepest wish, which is this coupling, and attempts an approach, but then shies away with a palliative humanist closure that avoids the vacuity of revenge's spectacle. In the film's last scene, the ruthless killer and perverse photographer of dead bodies mortally wounds the father and calmly sets about installing his tripod to take a photograph of his latest dying prey. The young and innocent son enters the room brandishing a gun to kill the killer and perform the ideal of revenge, that is to actualize the coupling of killer and victim side by side, both dead, both warm, both bleeding. At that moment, as if revenge for cinema is taboo, the father, in the last paternal effort, saves his son from becoming a murderer and shoots his killer in the back. And so instead of an accomplished and possibly disappointing revenge, but also instead of revenge's exaggerated untherapeutic fury, the film stages a mortal duel and saves the innocence of the young boy. Hyperbolic. Quotidian time is inimical to revenge. It drowns anger and dilutes intention. While waiting for the just time for Kairos, revenge must keep busy, safeguarding its anger against the passing days with excessive imagination and hyperbolic scenarios. 
the longer the wait, the more extravagant, extravagant the revenge. The more absent justice is, the more phantasmatic the avenging imagery. Yet no matter the extent of the hyperbole, revenge is not delusional. It never doubts itself, never questions its motives and intentions. It is born of skepticism and justice and a profound hatred of history. Revenge's extravagant counter-violence marks a forgotten and dismissed end of time. That is the time of the crime when all should have stopped, when history should have genuflected for forgiveness, when the perpetrator should have been hanged and left to wind and buzzards. Hyperbole is therefore necessary and never excessive, vociferous and never voluble. Hyperbole, hyperbole is revenge's preferred form. So if hyperbole, hyperbole or, the, or the exaggerated, extravagant spectacle is revenge's preferred form, we can argue that revenge is unconcerned with rearranging places or reorganizing the sequence of history. Again, unlike retribution, divine or legal, which is responsible for reinstating a just balance and for maintaining a symmetrical arrangement of things and deeds, revenge is roguishly asymmetrical. It brutally sits and weighs on one side of the extolled balance of justice and makes sure it tips out of joint. So revenge is not an equalizer. Apologies to Denzel Washington and cinema's alleged Avengers such as Charles Bronson, Clint Eastwood, Gina Davis, and Liam Neeson, who are, in fact, are not avenging figures, they are retributive figures, representative of a Jehovah anger that wreaks havoc to set things right. I think that the Avenger, on the, on the other hand, seeks a disproportionate imbalance for it's the only way to roll back history and force it to a halt. last proposition is precise. The asymmetry of revenge is always precise, whereas by comparison, murder is inescapably clumsy. Revenge works outside the domain of mastery where every action is compared, tested, and eventually judged. Murder, on the other hand, is always vying for perfection and therefore always haunted by the oversight, the mistake, or the loose thread that can possibly undo its crafty schemes. Unconcerned by judgmental mastery, revenge 
is implacably precise because its accuracy is equal to its spectacle, whereas murder is inevitably clumsy because it is firstly preoccupied with not being caught. So thoroughly asymmetrical is revenge that, unlike retaliatory violence which works by equal measures, the biblical sentence, right, fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, Revenge freely unweighs measures and upturns scales and proportions. Revenge is never paralyzed by massive crimes. It can fully mobilize an avenging counteract by synecdochically selecting and locating one specific perpetrator to stand for the whole. And when doing so, it unleashes on the selected one an extravagant scenography that asymptotically approaches the scale of the massive crime. Revenge's precision is not born of practice. Revenge does not need mentors or experts. Again, revenge feeds on history's dismissiveness, grows from the absence of justice, and it expands with phantasmatic scenarios and wants everyone to know when it does strike. I fear that the words and ideas I have thus far shared with you may seem eager, perhaps zealous, and that I may seem accordingly rather glib and vaguely cognizant of the severity of the violence of vengeance and of the figure that I have sketched. I'm perhaps guilty on all those counts, but inasmuch as I find myself able to write and articulate the figure of vengeance, I'm still caught without guards, profoundly troubled by their consequences. How do I know this? Why, how do I know that I'm troubled by vengeance even as I'm trying to articulate it? Because I've been reading, rereading lately, a, a novel <coughs> by Wajdi Ma'awad from 2012 titled Anima. Uh, this novel performs much of what I have just shared with you. Uh, the novel pierces through the already substantial oeuvre of Wajdi Ma'awad uh, with a violent extravagance that resists closure or catharsis. It's unusual, actually, in his work. The novel begins with a murder so gruesome, so unspeakable, that it has to be described by animals. So, the story is told by insects and birds and cats and wolves and rats. It begins with Leonie, a woman who lies in a pool of blood. Tortured, raped, mauled, and shredded, she is found by her husband, whose name is Wahash Dibish. His name is almost comical, but also enigmatic. He launches on a mad journey to find her killer. The story meanders through rapes, murders, always recounted by animals, birds, and insects. But the story of this particular revenge is haunted by another memory, more profound, that of the massacre of Sabra and Shetila. And so the novel leads us to a moment when Wahash Dibish discovers that he was saved by a Lebanese forces militia man named Maroon Dibish during the nights and days of the slaughter of Sabra and Shetila. And we learn that after torturing, raping, and killing his whole family, Maroon Dibish keeps the young boy of four years old and runs away with him. Now Wahsh Dibish, a grown man with a murdered wife, discovered that what was kept a secret and layers his avenging fury for his wife's killer with the deeper hatred of the young boy who saw but repressed the slaughter of his family by his foster father. His vengeance against his murderous savior is a spectacle that occurs in the desiccated, the dry desert of Tank Mountain, New Mexico, and witnessed only by a coroner friend who haplessly accepts the invitation to come and visit the site. So this is the hyperbolic uh, spectacle. So the revenge is done 
uh, through the voraciousness of scavenger vultures. Maroon Dibish is on the scorching rock floor, hands tied behind his back. His torture is guaranteed by an animal, a mixture of dog, wolf, and lion, who, tear, who tears at the limbs of the militiaman and forces the coroner to watch as the vultures tear at his flesh until all that is left is skeleton and rope. Ma'awa's novel is extremely difficult to read because, not only because of the graphic violence, but I think more importantly because it offers no resolution. The violence does not, is not cathartic. There's nothing really to learn from the violence. There's not a next day, right, a day to come after and heal, except perhaps in the last few pages when the author speculates about a language of monstrous speaking fish who live in the deepest seas, <laughs> guardians of an ancient language, a forgotten language, once, once spoken by humans and beasts on the shores of lost paradises. The author speculates, he says, maybe with that resurfaced, resurfaced language, the, the despairing, With that resurfaced language, the despairing narrator says, we may learn to speak again. We may invent new words. And Wahsh Dabish, or any one of us, may find his name, and all will not be lost. Let's return to that stencil graffiti. Stand and linger. And here, before this injunction and its impossibility, standing before this precision and its ex extravagance, before this kindness and its vacuity, we stand, I stand, maybe forever, or at least for a long time to come. It's so difficult to be here now. Thank you. <clears throat> open it up to the audience and if there are any questions on the zoom uh, we will be checking the, the yeah we'll be checking for the chat and also you can unmute yourself um, so as you were sharing this talk um, I couldn't help but start thinking about your um, sort of uh, most recent paper before this called A Surfeit of Victims, um, where you mark the shift in politics and subjectivity here. Um, and um, you say that we're in this time after the post-war uh, where we've all become neo-victims. So I, I was wondering if you could uh, place this paper and um, yeah, the act or the, the figure of vengeance in relation to the neo-victim. And um, also, I'm thinking specifically about um, a phrase you used in, in this paper, tergiversation, which is um, sort of the act of abandoning something you were committed to or being deliberately contrary or ambiguous, which is not vengeance necessarily, but the way there, I mean, uh, tergiversation was described or was used to describe um, 
the mother of a woman who, uh, the mother of a, of a man who, who, was, uh, who disappeared in the war um, in 1982. And uh, when she was shown um, in Ilyan Rahab's film, Sleepless Nights, the possible uh, place where his body could be found, um, she sort of turned away and um, it felt in the paper that you were saying that she seemed to hold on to this um, anger that she, uh, that she was feeling, despite the possibility of um, being placed as, um, being placed uh, somewhere where she has an answer, where she could become a victim, where she could enter mourning. Um, so I wanted to also want think with you about uh, the relation between turgiverization and vengeance a bit, if um, you right. could. <laughs> you have to go back to history. Yes. <laughs> so I suppose this is, this text is a, so just assuming we are no longer in the post war period, I mean, there, there are indications that we're not in the post war period. Hello, hello. So it's, there, are, there are many many signs that we're not in the post war period. And of course, it's, uh, it's our responsibility. It's, uh, Lecturers, artists, plumbers, carpenters, to think the conditions of living in this, uh, what I call a time after time, time post war. So, um, um, in the paper you mentioned, I, I try to capture one of the conditions of living in this time after time, and but first, and that, that first condition is that as time after time, history becomes horror. Um, in the sense that any attempt to think historically uh, leads, it seems, necessarily to kind of an endless recess, uh, French word is mise en ami. No matter how far you go back, no matter how much you dig, you excavate, uh, there is no core. You can never reach a working answer. Therefore, history becomes like it's mise en ami. It's horrific. Therefore, it's better to turn away from history if you turn away from history, if you exit your responsibility as being a subject, a subject of history, the only available position for us is to become victims. And of course, if you agree to become a victim, there's a, there's a whole range of uh, uh, available uh, uh, commodities for you. Right? There's a whole range of services available for you. All kinds of NGOs, therapy, uh, uh, funding for art projects, you name it. Like just be a victim, we'll take care of you as a victim, but step out of history. And it seems that this time after time, time after the post war, seems to uh, privilege the position of victim. Right? And that any attempt at thinking historically, like carrying the responsibility of history, right, is uh, foreclosed because history is is horrific. Um, okay, I'm sure we can debate this, but I mean that's the proposition. Um, so I, I suppose this this very short paper uh, is an attempt to think another condition, or like an, um, to layer uh, to layer the conditions of this time after time to to know right what are the the challenges right for living now. So when I in my attempt to articulate the, the figure of vengeance, although most of the paper seems to be, seems to be uh, like, like a forward-moving articulation, trying to, 
trying to trying to distinguish vengeance, as say, from retribution, from retaliation, for murder. Right? I think as I was writing, and it's still very fresh. Right? It's like I get to a point where <coughs> the ability to actually exact revenge, to take revenge, um, requires uh, an embodiment that seems right now to me almost impossible to to take on. Right? Um, so as much as the paper seems to articulate vengeance, it also is articulating why it is now impossible for us to actually take vengeance. Why this, why two years ago, and you know, for two years or three months, uh, this stencil graffiti, this declaration has not found an echo. Uh, the closest is what Ferris last week spoke about, this kind of dramatic eruption of uh, bank holding. <coughs> There's something comical that is appearing rather than uh, the extravagant, vacuous, hyperbolic uh, kind act of, act of revenge. I, I, I hope that, I mean, in my mind, that uh, thinking about vengeance allows me, allows us, I, I hope, uh, to further uh, understand the conditions of living in this time after time. Thank you. You asked about tergiversi. Yeah. It's a very ugly English word. Yeah. We should use it as a You <laughs> <laughs> can write it, but don't say yeah. it. <laughs> which one? Tergiversi, which is simply means to turn your back. Yeah. Verso. So in, in a film by Rian Raheb, towards the end of the film, uh, the mother of a, of a lost young communist fighter whose body is, has been lost, is told that it is most probably buried in this uh, mass grave, mass grave uh, on, the, on the Lebanese University campus. And she's taken there, the plot, plot of land. And what's beautiful about the film is that the mother, who's been waiting for an answer for many, many years, you know, as she approaches the threshold right, of finding the remains of her son, to her sits, <laughs> turns her back, and decides to hold on to her anger and continue the struggle, short struggle. Um, I fear that this ability to reverseate uh, is not an attribute of the victim. So we may be losing that ability as well to say no and hold on to a hold on to the unreconciled anger, uh, hold on to the anger of the unreconciled victim. Right? So the unreconciled victim is very different than the victim of NGOs and the human rights discourse and so forth. Um, thank you, Elliot. Um, I yeah, my next question is a bit, it's related to this because now that we're in the time after time, um, you've written in other texts about sort of the weight of, of the post-war, but in the time after time, uh, it seems that this weight has been lifted somehow. Um, uh, I wanted to ask a bit about also the weight of vengeance. What is the weight, you would say? And um, I mean, you've been quoted saying, I lifted Lebanon off my shoulders. Can you speak also about how um, weight in time after time uh, functions? Uh, um, how is it now liftable? <laughs> That's why we should never speak in public. <laughs> um, I think this echoes a lot what Ferris mentioned last yeah. week, is that uh, the post-war period is a period where, in, in, during which uh, some, not all of course, uh, decide to carry the weight of that recent history uh, why? Because this is the, the base idea is that without carrying the weight, right, uh, 
you have no access to this, uh, to the unwelcome knowledge that comes from the, from the world, and without which it's impossible to think of ways to build a livable, uh, a livable society after the war. So, carrying the weight uh, is not just kind of a dramatic gesture; it, it is necessary to think the post war. Uh, I think in this time after time, um, that weight seems. Uh, um, it has lost its its function. If you remember a few years ago, uh, a young artist, if he's here, please, I have nothing against what you've done, just that's my interpretation. I forgot the name of the young artist. He uh, somehow managed to uh, to get an, an authorization to uh, beautify uh, Burj Al Mar. You remember that he placed beautiful striped colorful awnings uh, on the windows, on all the windows of Burj Al Mar. It's very pretty, right? But when I saw it, it was, uh, it was to, me, it's like, to me an absolute sign that the post-war has ended because it is impossible, I think, to decorate and beautify Burj Al Mar unless something has already happened. And what has already happened in this case is that the war becomes a vague memory. Right? And that Burj al uh, about which we've heard so much, is a whole kind of, a, uh, kind of morbid history about Burj al uh, torture, imprisonment, and uh, These all become almost faint traces that can be um, disinfected right, by uh, by decoration. Uh, so, and this time after time, the weight of the world right, uh, kind of crumbles uh, because it has no function anymore. And the victim, this neo victim, comes in as uh, someone who is liberated from that weight, who has left his life. And through that levity, begins to function. Of course, it is kind of a, it's an uncritical levity. And on the other hand, if one of us, uh, if, I, if I said that I have lifted Lebanon off, off my shoulder, sho I think also it can be a critical move in the sense that persisting in carrying the weight of the post-war now may make of you kind of an admirable person, right? but you almost become like a pastiche of yourself. You also have to take that weight off. You have to take the weight off, but then not fall into uh, the trend of beautifying the past. But think again, okay, if I can't carry that, if that weight is no longer significant, right? what kind of language is now necessary? Right? What do I need to do right? to be able to function again as a historical subject and not as a new? Uh, again, the paper I share with you today is ambivalent because, in a sense, it seems to find and revenge a kind of a. Uh, it finds and revenge a historical action that is profoundly hateful of history. But then I catch myself towards the end feeling incapable. And this incapability is, I think, something what I need to do next. And to think, why are we incapable, because we have been incapable, of taking revenge? And I don't want to make it sound like, you know, we have failed somewhere. But we have to think those conditions, right? So this is work to be done. Um, I have many other questions, but I'm sure everybody else has questions, too. So maybe I'll let somebody else ask. So, can you also check on the social media? Yeah. Um, thank you so much for that. That was really moving. Um, it made me think a lot about how most of the revenge stories that I know involve women 
taking revenge. And it made a lot of sense when you started talking about how revenge happens when there's a lack of justice, because women have historically been left out of or let down by the justice system. But I've recently started hearing about revenge, or at least speaking of revenge, or expressing a desire for revenge as a form of healing. Um, and you mentioned healing a few times, but you were, it sounded to me like you, were, like you were saying it's separate from revenge, which I think I agree with. But I was curious, because the, the context that I'm thinking of when it comes to healing is, is not actually like carrying out the revenge necessarily, but for example, um, musicians, there, there's a musician in particular, Linguada Ignata, who has suffered abuse in her romantic relationships, and she uses uh, her music to, like a combination of that experience and then this fascination she has with Roman Catholicism, to express like anger against the people who have abused her because she found it so frustrating that the dialogue around being a victim of abuse was always about this sort of self-care and like being soft and being good to yourself and she was like no I'm angry like I'm so angry and and I want to be able to express that so she's not like going out and actually doing like expressing this revenge in reality but that it, I, I thought of that example because for her, that reflection of revenge is healing. And I was wondering, I just wanted to hear you, I guess, speak more on the idea of if there is a relationship between revenge and healing. Thank you. I think this is, this is uh, things I, I need to uh, think about and, and work into my text because I think you make something very clear that maybe I've only uh, alluded to. I th structurally, by, by proposing uh, anger as an aesthetic form, you provide a, um, a median position uh, between uh, the wrong committed, right? The, the hurt person and the exaction, like taking on the event, right? And I think this is possibly a way, this is a place to think about, like anger as an aesthetic, right? And what does it do, right? How does one, how does, how does one complexify a particular form? But it seems to me that um, maybe I rushed, but I, mean, I was more, more, uh, I was called upon for today to think of that possibility of actually committing the act of revenge, right? And uh, which is which is a, it's a, it's a daunting proposition because uh, you have to you have to get rid of many you have to get rid of many hopes the moment you decide to exact revenge. You have to, first of all, decide that you're not losing anything, and you're not losing your innocence. You're not using your place in humanity, right? Uh, on the contrary, you have to switch it around and say that uh, all of these moral values were lost the moment the crime was committed. In that sense, revenge is loyal to that moment, yani. And we, we, hear, we hear that often, right? People, when, when, when a loved one dies, for, for whatever reason, could be natural reasons. Um, I know from my mother, right, uh, who's a very devout Christian, right? I mean, uh, she allowed herself at moments when my, my dad died to, to voice her anger in the presence of clergymen, but very faintly, right? Because in a sense, we have to go back to the narrative of Christianity, right? Uh, but this, this piercing through, right, saying that nothing should live on after the crime. The world is not allowed to continue. Um, yeah. Beirut should not have had a day after the 4th of August, 2001. 
2020. It is not allowed. And I think the, the, the uh, vengeance seems to me to uh, articulate this refusal to move forward. Uh, but, but of course, the cost is exorbitant, right? And of course, you have to let go of any hope for healing or catharsis or reconstructing yourself. Um, I've been reading lately about, uh, I've been reading some psychoanalytic texts about revenge. I don't know why it seems like it's a, it's a thing to write about right now. And they try in very, com uh, very complex, uh, sophisticated ways to subdivide revenge. And they propose this one psychoanalyst that, that revenge is actually a form of reconstructing the self. Interesting proposition. Uh, I don't see it. I think that there's uh, in the act of revenge there's something uh, something reckless, and you do it because of your loyalty to the moment of the crime. Uh, that's when history should stop for you. Right? Um, and having said this, right. There is a second day, right? We continue. Um, uh, but maybe what I haven't seen, but I mean, again, I kind of live in a small bubble, but can you tell me? I, I'm not sure I have seen or read lately uh, these works of art that take on the task of giving aesthetic form to anger. But that's a question to the audience. If you have, please share them. That could be very interesting. You smile, so if that you know. No. <laughs> um, a simple question concerning uh, the graffiti itself. In fact, isn't uh, the person thinking of the person who did this on the wall? In fact, he may be or she may be uh, full of uh, angriness, but at the same time full of hope. Because if you want to revenge from something, you do it. And you did uh, talk about that in the text, saying it's something you don't think of for a long time. You just do it. So isn't this a sign of uh, hope? on the walls of uh, Beirut, saying, yes, we still have hope, so we just can write it on the wall and do nothing? That's a, that's a good point. I think, I hope I, hope I, I, I did this and the text that I'm trying to say that the revenge has nothing to do with hope. It's not, it seems to me, unlike retribution again, right? divine or legal. Revenge seems to me that it's not really concerned with uh, initiating a hopeful time to come after the crime. Revenge is only about stopping things, right? I'm talking and about the incredible spectacle. And so the question that you raise is, uh, yes, that's the question that we don't, I mean, it's spec we have to speculate whether this, uh, this graffiti sees in revenge the possibility, and, and, and if this graffiti sees in revenge an aspirational gesture, that by, by avenging we actually make things better. Uh, and it seems like a semantic thing, maybe we should call it retribution, right? But I think it's nevertheless interesting to distinguish between what these terms uh, are calling for us to do. Uh, what I have written seems to be, to be telling me that revenge uh, demands a figure that is much more complex, uh, extravagant, and reckless. And, and retribution aligns you, right? If you, are, if you are the person who thinks here about retribution, that you have already aligned yourself with a justice that supposedly is greater than the failed uh, judicial system that has allowed for the crime to happen and remain unpunished. Um, but that's another thing, right? Where do you get that from? Right? Uh, is, it, is, it a divine, is, it divine, is it a divine justice that you believe in, right? 
which is often seen in the books written in the last 10 years by ex-Civil uh, War combatants, right? where the way for them to step out of the war, to step out of being fighters, they become combatants for the Lord. Right? They all have this epiphany in jail. Right? They become fighters for the truth of Christ, for example. But in the absence of this uh, divine retribution that you align yourself with, or a revolutionary party. That's another retribute of justice, or kind of a, life, a radical communist party. We don't have it anymore, right? Uh, what, what remains? It remains revenge, right? And revenge is not, uh, is not a builder. It's not constructive revenge. Sorry, I'm just reading a comment from Faris Shalabi. Um, he says, hello, Walid. Yeah, the Zoom is not working, so people are commenting on Instagram. I think, yeah, they went to Instagram. Yeah, so I will read uh, Faris's comment. Um, uh, hello, Walid. Can't talk. The Zoom is off. It makes me think of Sergio Leone Westerns, where revenge fuels an optical choreography of spectacular precise vacuous violence. I mean, th there is work being done, I think, lately on Western films and the thought of revenge. There's an American Texan philosopher named, uh, what's his first name? Last name, French. Uh, he wrote a book about Christian. <laughs> 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 French, you wrote a book called the, the, the Value of Revenge, The Values of Revenge. That's a worthwhile read. Uh, but I think it, it kind of leads to kind of a opening up on a kind of a therapeutic angle to revenge that I'm resisting here for, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, uh, it just seems uh, for me false, right? Uh, disingenuous to, to come tell you that somehow revenge will make you a better person. I just don't believe Well, that. imagining it and executing it, I think, are vastly, vastly different right. things. True, true. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I was just sort of uh, riffing off of those last points um, around the issue of, of um, yeah, around this, these kinds of distinctions, and I was just, the, the image of Suhab Shara sort of propped in my mind about this, the kind of spectacular, the spectacularity of, of the act, but also, I mean, because it sort of delineated or kind of like gave me contours of what you're not, of what you're not also defining, right? So this sort of like hero, um, but also on but also sort of insisting on perhaps the necessity of the action, of the act of revenge. So, so I'm, I'm just wondering whether you're, you're thinking about, about an anti-hero or not. About this sort of like, you know, um, because, because the catharsis uh, or the sort of healing runs counter to this historical time. Um, and is also um, and is also sort of the quotidian's life's enemy, right? So I'm trying to also sort of also yeah, look at kind of cultural references around this kind of maybe uh, a contour or maybe um, uh, the figure of an anti-hero, uh, the the avenger, the avenger, basically. Um, yeah, I don't know if, if this is something that if this is something that you've thought about. Uh, but just a clarification: you, you mentioned the act of uh, what's her name right now? So I'm sure. What do you mean? Which act? The the the, 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 the act attempted. Yeah. Uh, so the I mean, we, we could we could also debate whether. So we could also debate whether this is retaliation and retribution, and whether this was revenge, right? Absolutely. But I, I just evoked her because because she really sort of popped in my mind uh, about this this sort of 
Because as far as I remember, this was not a retaliation to, right? This was, uh, this was an assassination, but I feel like there's also an, uh, I feel like you could call it revenge, though. Um, perhaps not, but I'm, honestly, it, she came up. Um, she came up also in reference, in reference to this sort of like anti, yani heroic action, anti-heroic action, um, because revenge is essentially, in my mind, or at least from, from, from what I understand right now, to be an anti-heroic act, right? Because there is no catharsis, because you're not, you know, there's no sort of, there's an end to something. I don't, there's some, it's something to, for me to think about, but, um, yeah. I mean, just to think together, uh, I mean, there's certainly a question, but the question seems to have been foreclosed very quickly when Suhab Shara was released from incarceration, and she was received as a hero. Mm -hmm. And um, from, I don't know her personally, but uh, from reading, I think she has three books already now, you, you can you can see how much she's struggling with that hero figure that she's supposed to embody. But now that doesn't mean that she wants to be recognized as an avenging anti-hero. But there's a problematic uh, that there's no room in, in the figure of the hero for her. There's no room for the for the complexity, for the mixed emotions, for the contradictions of the person of the historical person, um, whether or not. Her attempted assassination of uh, Saad Haddad uh, was an act of was an act of revenge. This was because Saab Shara belonged. I mean, she's a member of the uh, right of the Communist Party, and therefore the Communist Party, as a as a historical, but also as a as an ahistorical. Uh, project, right? Because the Communist Party, in a sense, is a, is a, is, is part of a project to end a certain history and to begin a, a classless time, right? Uh, can take on the position of a quote unquote a Jehovah retributive justice, right? So we go and we shoot Saad Haddad because you know he belongs to a uh, to a counter history. He's counter revolutionary. He should die, right? Uh, Sophia Iqab, right? Uh, I think revenge comes from a position of having lost and knowing that you've lost, right? And the extra extravagant, hyperbolic spectacle of of revenge that is not at all worried about being uh, getting caught or or getting retaliated against, right? Uh, makes of revenge an, an exorbitant, reckless gesture that kind of, sorry, that pisses on history. And it's, uh, intellectually, it's very interesting, right? Because from here, from here on, I don't know, right? <laughs> we have to just calm down, have a drink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is precisely what, you know, uh, I mean, t trying to sort of, um, Try, trying to find you or find the the story of the revenge by sort of by elimination. Actually, <laughs> uh, uh, soon after the 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 official end of the civil war, but I don't have dates and names, but like there's something to think about. There were there were uh, a news of uh, individuals who returned to their. Um, destroyed or pushes of villages in the Shuf, right? But remember the stories of certain Maronite Christians who returned to their villages from, from which they've been uh, expelled, where their families have been killed, and they have taken revenge. But what's interesting is that in the story I remember that that person who was a Christian and who actually went back and shot one or two or three people who he thinks were responsible for, for, the, for the massacre of, the, of his family were quickly shipped away by uh, Walid Jumblat. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that revenge is not allowed to happen. Mm -hmm. 
I wish we to think, well, we live in a tribal society, right? You kill, you know, you kill me, I kill you, right? I kill you, you kill my son, whatever. I kill a hundred horses. But that's retribution again. So it's not, as the more I think about revenge as a very particular animal, then we need to really think about it. And maybe thinking about it is a way not to do it. But the first one was the subtle as well, as real act of revenge. It was... Why do you think it's revenge? Because this guy who was not even a fighter or anything has lost his uh, two kids at the same day, two days before Sabt al-Aswad, I think. Yes. And he then just gathered some boys and went to downtown, I think, in Aswad and uh, just killed the people. But it got stopped now. It could also be seen as retribution. Like, no, it has. The, 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 this, the, the guy was... And he used to work in Lorient Le Jour. He was not a criminal, neither a, a, a fighter, nothing. He just left his home early morning, Saturday morning, and went and just stopped people on the street and killed them. So I think this, this is the first known revenge uh, like act in the war. And the, the other one I thought about was the chakra. Uh, yeah. story, you know. So, they are pure revenge, in fact. That's a good yeah, it, it, yeah. it, 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 uh, it follows the scheme you put there. That's a good point. I didn't think of the, because what we know of that, so there's, there's the book published in Arabic by Dan al-Jadid, uh, titled, Ana Jalab wa Tahiyyana, right? Uh, I'm the victim and I'm the Perpetrator. Uh, uh, yeah, originally, originally wrote it in French. Yes. Yeah. Ghost written, by the way. Yeah. Uh, I didn't even write it. It's like he was just like talking to two journalists. That actually, it's a little delivered uh, the manuscript after. But yeah, you were actually saying. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you were saying something before about like uh, anger being represented aesthetically. So if you asked about some references or yes. something. I'm, I'm a bit sick, so that's why my voice is trembling. So <clears throat> what I wanted to say is like, uh, I can, I'm very interested first of like, uh, what is the opposite of averting? I do believe like that, Judge said opposite. it, as, yeah, the opposite of averting. We can say that it's like might be creating or like to put something new that wasn't there before. But if I want to take like Jacek's point of view on philosophy, he once was asked about like uh, uh, what is philosophy and how can we redefine how can we define philosophy? And he said like we we usually think that philosophy is creating concepts, but uh, I do believe that we have to redefine those concepts. So uh, what I'm trying to say here is like all the things that you've mentioned. Uh, you've mentioned so many concepts as well, but sometimes we actually do like fall into the trap of language as well because we tend to, to, to write with dictionaries and so many things. And uh, could you tell me, tell me where did I fall into? Yeah, uh, first when you were like trying, actually I, I, I do believe that like, this like, uh, uh, it's a very short, the lecture is very short because I know I understand, but the last time it was the same that uh, you, you want to make a point, but at the same time you miss actually certain points. Yeah. When the lecture actually is not like uh, given the time that it needed, but I will go back to the to the aesthetics that you was like you were asking about. I can actually take a very like uh, personal and uh, autobiographical uh, uh, oeuvre, and I can talk here about Marguerite Duras. I do believe that like wh wh what you said about anger. Is very manifested in her in her writing. She once said, "Détruire pour tout, reconstruire, and détruire détail." So I do believe after like when she wrote uh, *Un barrage contre le Pacifique* and uh, this uh, book that she turned into a film, *Détruire uh, détail*, she actually did uh, work with anger as a aesthetic matter. Even if you have to. But you have to dig very deep, I guess, into that because, like, she's not uh, well sophisticated in that matter. She doesn't use this language that's just like 
it builds on concepts and it never ends. Uh, so through an intimate archive and a personal archive, she actually deals and navigates through these different things. So this is one that I can actually just like tell you about. Um, what I was, what I wanted to say as well about uh, uh, what was it? You just mentioned something that I. Yeah, this thing that we actually tend uh, referring to, uh, to her question. We always try to like think about vengeance as a healing act or something, but I don't believe it's like it's very banal at the same time. So I don't know if it's much needed. Uh, what can we take if if we don't want to actually be heroes and we don't want to represent those figures that we actually that are predominant in the media and other places as well. What can be the replacement of vengeance? But not in a very, like, yeah, we can tend to, to write uh, a text that deals with concepts and other things and just like trying to actually never solve the problem because in the first place it's, uh, it cannot actually be rescued. And uh, we can compose our piece of music or do another thing, but what is can be done? What, what can be done to actually uh, to actually deal with this, but not to fall into the victim thing, which is what they said. What you actually said, because the victim doesn't read, uh, the victim doesn't write, the victim doesn't move. It's very the victim is just like very occupied of like being just the victim. So it becomes a statue in a, in a museum or something. So yeah, that's I know that like I talked so many uh, about so many things, but I just like want you wanted to to refer to what you said and just uh, understand more if I can. Thank you so much. I'm not gonna respond. It's very so you can listen to it again. Not that it's not but I. Hi, uh, I was thinking about what Amelia was saying about uh, the the uh, vengeance is something a woman desire, desires for having been been uh, a victim of violence, um, and that usually um, I, it reminded me of a conversation. I was having with a friend in, in Tehran recently about how women in Tehran uh, do not want to commit acts of violence against the men who have uh, abused them uh, or the violence of the state. And in the, ch in the chants, in the funeral, and in the 40th um, uh, anniversary of uh, Sina Amiri's uh, death, uh, the chant was Sanantaqim, they use the same word, uh, but we will overthrow the government. We will not kill someone else, which is actually different than the kind of uh, slogans you would hear when uh, there were deaths, uh, killings of uh, leaders uh, from the Iranian regime by, by the Israelis, and how the vengeance requires the killing of another person. And what struck me about this graffiti, it, it, because it reminded me of a graffiti, another graffiti where there were um, illustrations of the political leaders hung by ropes, and the slogan was uh, or something like that, which is we will, we will, uh, we will hang them. And, uh, but this, uh, this graffiti leaves an ambiguity, which I think is interesting, which is, it is not telling us how, what is the actual act of vengeance, because you kept referring to it as if there was going to be, uh, you were using that versus another death uh, as a kind of uh, asymmetry or the symmetry. So I'm wondering if you have thought about uh, if this ambiguity is intentional, um, and and what, um, yeah, and what, uh, what it could, uh, what what was the reason for for if it's intentional? 
Um, I agree with you. And, and uh, the, the uh, example you bring from Tehran, right, that we will avenge. And By overthrowing the government. Yeah, our revenge is to overthrow the government. I think this, this uh, structural clarity is not something we have in Lebanon. Government. So, <laughs> you're right. Sanam taqim, but how we don't know, and against whom we don't know. So already, it, uh, inscribed in, in the slogan uh, is the complexity of the local situation. Um, but I think what I will try to do is that try to articulate an understanding of revenge here by saying that. Um, there's something about revenge, at least what I'm thinking about it, is that when I said it's very precise, it's, it's, you can, revenge can only be precise in Lebanon if you don't think about the exact uh, body that you're going to attack. There's, there's, a kind of a, there's a kind of an explosive revenge, right? That's not really against any one person, but it's against precisely it's kind of uh, it's kind of amoral continuation of time in Lebanon. That the act of revenge is primarily, I think, I haven't said this, it's against history here, against against the history of the victorious. How do things continue? Right? Is it possible to to stage a revenge? Right? That is not necessarily against the vehicle or whatever, or another, right? But are there a revenge against? our ability, right, to continue. Right? Uh, I wish we were in Tehran. I wish we had a, a strong regime, right? It's just so, things are so diffuse that makes revenge very difficult, but also demands of us to re reconsider the aesthetic form of revenge. Yeah. Hello? But also in the graffiti, <laughs> it says, we will. Yeah. It's not, we are. Not the revenge. There is a temporality that's uh, it's not now. It's uh, so when, when, delayed. When, when, when? Delayed revenge. Sure. It's a, when, to think any. What is the temporality of revenge now in this? Uh, it's, it's precisely what allows us to think because uh, if you. If you take revenge, there's no need to write a graffiti. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's like you know, in the seventies when they used to graffiti, the revolution will, will not be televised. It's already too late. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just too late. But it allows us to think. Uh, again, I, I didn't have time, but I think that I think what I, what I've tried to do is to articulate another condition of living in the time after the post-war more so than trying to provide you with the tools to actually take <laughs> Why is it that we cannot? This is another condition. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Having this slogan for two years on the walls in Las Beirut is symptomatic of a condition. That shows who Saadi, George? George? Oh, the guy who supposedly yeah. is responsible for the Saturday. Black Saturday, right? He didn't go around writing on the walls, I will avenge my two sons. <clears throat> so that's another time, right? And I think uh, it's important that we find, we understand the time we live in, what is possible, what's not possible. Sorry, I will just ask one more question and give it to you. Um, so, Yes, we're stuck in this time. We're not necessarily able to enact revenge. We're not necessarily, I mean, yeah, we're stuck in possibly as neo victims. Um, we've lifted the weight. You've briefly mentioned um, beauty as something. Um, and you're also painting. So and as an artist, I need to, <laughs> I need to ask ab about this. Um, I wonder if you could sort of talk about the act of creating with material things that are beautiful in this moment where we are stuck and we're unable to enact. Yeah. I'll talk about my friend instead. Uh, 
That's not my hoji. Who is the painter? I'm just a, just a late I'm an afterthought. <laughs> so Bassam, you probably don't, maybe some of you don't know. He he's a, he's been painting for forty years, and uh, it's, it's slightly mythological, but I like it. Like in the early nineties, Bassam recognized that there was a move towards installation art, so-called neoconceptual art, and he decided that he's not going to do that. But he also decided that under the dominance of this art, he will stop painting. So his loyalty to painting demanded of him to stop painting. And he didn't paint, at least not publicly, for almost 30 years. And then a few months after the, the Beirut Harbor detonation, he had an exhibition at the Ajian Gallery where he filled the gallery, two floors, with drawings and paintings in kind of a, like an excessive way. He just like filled it with his drawings and paintings. And the, the reaction was surprising. You know, people did not go and just like blame him. How could you do beautiful abstract painting after the, the blast? And how could you? Are you? On the contrary, it was an incredible, uh, uh, return because there was a generosity. Um, and of course, if you want to banalize, you can say that he provided us with pretty pictures that healed the wounds, right? <laughs> <laughs> but in fact, they're not so pretty if you look at them. But he doesn't do, doesn't make pretty pictures. But I think there was a there was a moment, right, when it seemed like. It is possible to, to not reconstruct, that term has, has already been appropriated by construction group, but so somehow to build, right? To build with what's available. And I think uh, his work, maybe I'm, I'm involved in something like this, is that you build with what's available, and what's available, you know, the, the material of what you are building with is always present in the object. Uh, so there's something historical about the work. Right? Beauty, yes, I mean, it's not something we talk about much. I think we are always afraid of speaking about the beautiful as if we're somehow uh, capitulating to the decorative or the, the ornamental. Uh, so, you know, I simply say that I'm, I'm guilty, I love beauty. <laughs> and I think that's something we should really take care of in everything. Um, yeah, following up on, uh, I don't know, f uh, Frenchness and um, revenge, uh, there is a saying in French that says, um, uh, la vengeance est un plat qui se mange froid. So revenge is a, something you eat cold. It's me, you eat cold. Yeah. And it's true that, I mean, following on what everything that you're saying, I, I can't be totally convinced about this uh, recklessness. Of, uh, of revenge and that it is indeed is a space of thinking and a space of rationality um, where uh, and that is future oriented but uh, uh, breaks history well, or to some level. So yeah, I wanted to uh, maybe suggest that it's uh, yeah, um, um, maybe a specific kind of complicity between um, recklessness and rationality, or hyper-affective rationality. I mean, I mean the, this idea of the, the saying that you just uh, mentioned uh, is, is a very concise way of summarizing that famous poem by William Blake, right? So William Blake talks about the poison tree, right? I was angry with my friend. I spoke about it to my friend and the anger went away. I was angry with my foe. I watered it. You know, I took care of it and it became a tree. It gave beautiful, attractive apples. My foe came, ate the apples, and the morning after, I was happy to see my foe dead next to the tree. It's kind of like feeding that anger. Um, yes, there is that, right? There is that. Uh, there is that kind of preparation. But I think, at least what I try to do, is that at that stage, uh, 
revenge and murder are similar. There's preparation. Uh, I try to propose a difference between the two is that murder wants to remain an expert act. You want to go all the way, kill, and get away with it. No one knows, right? That's the perfect crime, right? You do it, there are no traces. There's something about revenge here that I think about is that after the preparation, uh, it's a public thing. You are really unconcerned with being caught. Yeah, there is no, there's no, there's no after. Uh, I sh I'm sure that maybe there are in different contexts we can qualify vengeance. I would like to, I would like to think that vengeance in Beirut now is not the same as say as vengeance in Chile. Why not? Right? Different kinds of. Or a time of war, like Bassam mentioned as well. Or it's, it's not the actual vengeance that had happened. If Sabt al Aswad is not necessarily what you're trying to kind of frame as vengeance in the time of the now or the collapse. Yeah, I mean, and Sabt al Aswad, I think this, the impossibility that I tried to articulate here was not impinging on, on vengeance back then. Um, again, you have to think, why not? Like, uh, but it's, 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 it's said something out of the body, right? About the historical subject that we are now versus where, where we were. So it's another way, so vengeance is just another way of understanding where we are at today, I suppose. Time for a drink. <laughs> <laughs> it's heavy. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Wendy.